Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome everyone. Today we're going to run through a bunch of sports card industry terms, many of which can be extremely confusing. Uh, this video is really aimed at people who are sort of newer to the hobby. I, I get comments all the time from people just getting started, you know, hey, I don't understand this term and, and it's completely understandable. You know, tr trust me when I say that there are plenty of intermediate uh, uh, collectors and dealers who, who don't understand these terms at times and even some experts who, who get confused and I mean even me I, somebody asked me recently you know is that card an RPA and I, I said you know I don't even know the official rules at this point but uh, just to be clear this is not a complete list these aren't there, there are plenty of other terms that, that I didn't include here but these are probably the terms I think are the most important or, or they're at least the important ones that I get asked about the most so uh, broken into 10 categories so with uh, that being said let's let's go ahead and learn some uh, industry terms here all cards fit into one of three categories. Well, all modern cards anyway, and, and we're talking about for the most part here. Base cards, inserts, and parallels. Technically, there are parallel inserts as well, but let's, uh, let's not go crazy here. Base cards refer to cards from the basic set. For example, 2009 Topps Basketball. It's a set with 330 cards in it. All 330 cards are base cards, whether it be the stars, the commons, the rookies, uh, whatever. When you, when you buy a pack of cards, you usually get mostly base cards. The, the vast majority of cards in the hobby are base cards. Parallels are usually a lot rarer and look very similar to base cards but have something different about them. Usually the color is different but uh, it can be a variety of things. Here are a few examples of parallels. The card on the left in each example is the base card and the card on the right is a parallel. Sometimes parallels can be kind of difficult to identify since you know it's just like a minor difference between the base card and the parallel but like I said usually parallels are rarer and uh, more valuable. And the third type of card is inserts. Inserts are cards you can pull out of packs but are not base cards or parallels. They're inserted into packs somewhat randomly, usually with stated odds. Like you'll pull one of these inserts every 10 packs or one per box or whatever it is. The tougher the odds, the more valuable the cards are generally. You can see these cards are from 2009 Topps Basketball as well and you can get them in packs but they're not part of the base set. The, these inserts, for example, are titled Round Ball Remnants, Draft Snapshot, and McDonald's All-American Autographs. Uh, here are just a couple more examples of each of the three types of cards. All right, a couple terms to know regarding autographs. Autograph simply meaning when a player has signed the card. This is often shortened to auto. Um, I once had a friend who knew nothing about cards. I told him a card was an auto and he asked, Oh, you mean like a like a car? That's a true story. Autographs tend to be inserts, but not always. They can uh, they can also be base cards or parallels as well. Um, an important term to know regarding autographs is on card auto. Often, when a card uh, company is gonna let's say have Patrick Mahomes sign a bunch of cards, they'll just mail him a bunch of sticky pieces of clear plastic for him to sign. He mail he signs them and then mails them back at his leisure, and then they can put the the sticky pieces of plastic onto cards whenever they want. These are considered less desirable than on-card autos, where the player actually has signed the card uh, on the card directly with, with no sticky piece of plastic. The reason on-card autos are more desired is because they, they first, they tend to look better, but secondly, you know the players you know, signed it that year and companies can't stockpile autographs. P Panini, for example, was rumored to have a large stockpile of Kobe Bryant autographs sticky plastic, so they could in theory just keep putting out Kobe Bryant autographs cards every year even though he's, he's passed away. Whereas you, you can never again produce another on-card auto of Kobe Bryant. Starting in the late 1990s, card manufacturers started putting pieces of game-used jerseys or pieces of the balls or bats onto cards. These have lots of names at this point which all, all basically mean the same thing. A jersey, patch, game-used memorabilia, and relic all essentially mean the same thing that the card has a piece of something game-used on it. Jersey and patch really mean they have a piece of a jersey. You might hear someone say, you know, is this a jersey card or is that, that a patch card? And, and, and they, mean, they mean the same thing. Same goes for game used memorabilia and relic, although those two terms are a little more broad. They, they can include, you know, not just a piece of a jersey, but they could also be a piece of a bat or a ball or a shoe or, or whatever. The term rookie card has gotten more and more confusing over the years and What's officially a rookie card will vary based on who you ask. It's, it's a little easier in football and basketball because player, players generally play at the top level in their first year of being drafted. In those two sports, rookie card generally means a base card of a player in their first year. 
Luka Doncic's first year is 2018, so any base card he has from a licensed brand in 2018 is a rookie card. Uh, parallels of base, uh, base rookie cards are generally considered rookie cards as well. Inserts are not. Uh, baseball is trickier because players often play in the minors for many years, but have uh, cards throughout the minors. Major League Baseball implemented a rule that an official rookie card can only be in the first year after he has played in the majors. So Manny Machado, for example, has cards dating back to 2009, but his rookie card is from 2013, since that's when he made his Major League debut. For Manny Machado, his rookie cards are base cards from 2013. This has led to a couple of other terms. Pre-rookie refers to a card that came out before his rookie and applies, applies mostly to baseball, but occasionally other sports as well. You know, for Machado, any card he has before 2013 are pre-rookies. But some collectors prefer a player's first card over their technical rookie card. Again, this really only is significant in baseball, but since Bowman was not allowed to put an RC label on cards prior to their Major League debut, they came up with the term first Bowman card or, or first Bowman chrome card, which is usually a significantly desired card in the hobby. For Manny Machado, his first Bowman card is 2010 Bowman, and you can see the label there, first Bowman card. These have become even more significant in recent years. Here are a few other, you know, first Bowman or first Bowman chrome cards. These are all technically pre-rookies since they came out before the player's uh, Major League debut. RPA is an important three-letter combination to be aware of. RPA stands for Rookie Patch Autograph. A card that's an RPA is simply all three of these things, a rookie, a patch, and an autograph. Uh, here are a few examples of RPAs. You can see all, all these cards are rookie cards, have an autograph, and have a patch. Sort of a weird exception, but inserts from a player's rookie year that have an autograph and a patch are generally considered RPAs as well, even though inserts are, are usually not considered rookies. I already mentioned what parallels are, and there are hundreds of different parallel sets, way too many to cover here, but there are three we'll mention here as they are particularly important. First is refractors. These come in Topps brand, so today they are only found in uh, baseball cards of the big four sports. Uh, they also exist in soccer, Formula One, MMA, and uh, others, but not football, basketball, nor hockey for present year cards. They uh, exist in football, basketball, and hockey in past years, but at some point Topps lost licensing in those sports, so uh, they do not produce uh, cards today in those sports. Refractors are parallels that refract the light. They, they are most common in Topps Chrome, Bowman Chrome, and Topps Finest, but uh, even other some other Topps brands as well. Refractors are hugely popular today, and uh, refractors of, of major stars or key rookies can be big bucks. They often come in a, a variety of colors, as you can see uh, an example of here. Prism parallels are basically the equivalent uh, of refractors in all the sports, but most significantly basketball and football. Panini Prism is the key brand in those sports uh, present day, and their, and their Prism parallels, like, like refractors, sort of refract the light and come in a variety of colors, also extremely popular today. Prism parallels of, of major stars or key rookie cards can also be, you know, big bucks. And the last parallel I mentioned here are Tiffany's. These were produced from 1984 to 1991 in baseball, mainly just tops, but a couple other uh, sets, Bowman score and Fleer as well. Football and hockey also each have a Tiffany set from 1990. During this era, cards were often, you know, not worth very much because they were just mass produced, but the Tiffany's can hold a lot of value because they're much, just much rarer. They're on sort of nicer card stock, a lot glossier, and the usually the easiest way to tell if a card is a Tiffany is by looking at the back, as the back will be a lot shinier. The term serial number is very significant. The vast majority of cards are not serial numbered, but those that are generally have more value as the exact number of copies in existence is known. A serial number is usually stamped onto the card, usually on the back, but that can be on the front as well. If a card is serial numbered 14 out of 100, that means that there are only 100 copies of this card on the planet. Each one has a unique serial number, in this case card number 14 out of 100. This should not be confused with the card number itself. Basically all cards have a card number. For example, this card here is uh, number 11 in the set, but that's not the serial number. A serial number is again two numbers with a slash in between. The second number being the number that really matters, as that's the total production quantity of the card. The best serial number a card can have is a one of one, which is another term to be aware of. This means that 
this is the only copy of this card that exists, and these, car, uh, these cards always come with a premium price tag. The hobby has changed over the decades, and, and grading is king. Cards are most valuable when they are professionally graded. A grading company is providing a number of services by encapsulating your card. First, they are protecting the card. Second, they are authenticating the card, guaranteeing that it's original and not a fake. And uh, third, they are grading the card on its condition, giving it a score between 1 and 10. All grading companies go by a three-letter title. Not, not sure why this is. It just sort of worked out that way. Uh, in order of number of submissions that they receive, the three biggest grading companies are uh, first, PSA, second, BGS, and third, SGC. BGS also has a vintage division known as BVG, and they're also known as Beckett. Uh, a couple of up-and-coming companies include HGA and CSG, and there are a number of other much smaller companies out there, including GMA, PGI, MNT, and some others. You, you don't need to know what any of these stand for. I don't even know what some of them stand for, but uh, you hear a three-letter combination. It probably refers to a grading company. They, they all essentially use the same grading scale, 1 to 10. These are the terms for each numerical grade here. Uh, at the very top, there are some variations between the companies. As uh, you know, some call 9.5s and 10s different terms, including Gem Mint, Mint Plus, Pristine, and Perfect. Uh, all companies use one way or another the term uh, Gem Mint. Three grading terms I want to go over here. Uh, first is subgrades. Not all the grading companies, uh, but some of them use subgrades, and it's becoming more and more standard as, as we get go along. Subgrades are included on the label and show you the grade of the card in four categories, corners, edges, surface, and centering. You can see the uh, each of these categories gets a 1 to 10 grade, and these are usually uh, used to determine the overall grade of the card. Th these four categories are known as the subgrades. A true gem is a fairly new term which refers to a card which has all four subgrades being at a gem mint level, meaning a 9.5. For example, this card is graded at a gem mint 9.5, but it's not a true gem since one of its subgrades is a 9. This card, on the other hand, is a true gem as all four subgrades are at least a 9.5. And the last grading term to cover is an important one, and it's the term I probably get asked about more than any other, pop count. Pop count refers to the population of a graded card. Each of the grading companies maintains a database of every card they've ever graded. You can see this data on their websites. For example, if we uh, look at this 2018 Topps Chrome Pink Refractor Ronald Acuna, PSA has graded this card a total of 642 times. Of those, it was given a 10 grade a total of 485 times. If you owned this card in a PSA 10, you would say the pop count on this card is 485. Or you could also say this is a PSA pop 485. If you had it in a PSA 9, you could say it's a PSA POP 152 and there are 485 copies graded higher. Understanding the POP report and how the POP count you know, impacts prices is a critical aspect of being a more advanced uh, collector or, or investor or dealer. Last category here, just a few of the industry leading companies I get asked about a lot. The Golden Auctions is the largest auction house on the planet for high-end sports cards. They currently run about two auctions a month on their website, and every auction they have features multiple six-figure card sales. They generally fetch some of the highest prices in, in the business. There are other high-end auction houses as well, including Heritage Auctions, Memory Lane, uh, and Robert Edwards Auctions. PWCC stands for Pre-War Card Collector and is the largest auction house for sports cards on eBay. They run all of their auctions on eBay, and like I said, they are the top dog in this category, also fetching some of the highest prices in the business. CUMC stands for Check Out My Cards, and it's the, the largest consignment company in the sports card hobby uh, in terms of quantity of cards. Their, their website, cumc.com, currently has over 100 million cards for sale, all on consignment. So that's it, just a bunch of key industry terms to be aware of. Hope you guys found this helpful. Uh, if there are any terms you, you didn't fully understand, or if you have any other terms you're not sure about, you know, please feel free to leave any questions in the comments, and I'll do my, my best to answer them. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. And again, really hope you, hope you found it helpful, and see you again real soon. Thanks, guys.